as soon as I started talking about women's rights, they started mining my history for things to use to destroy me. And the funny thing about me is I was such a good little lefty that they couldn't find anything. So they had to make stuff up. Coming up on British thought leaders Graham Linehan, one of Britain's most successful sitcom writers and creator of Father Ted, talks about losing his career and more. They targeted me and my family. They released my, my family's home address. Uh, they sent the police to my door several times. And at the same time, all these people who I had known for my whole life, had been friends with, just completely deserted me. Graham discusses the views that got him cancelled and how anti-human ideology has taken over the arts. Of course women deserve fair sports. Of course women deserve single sex spaces. Of course a victim of rape shouldn't be placed in a crisis centre with, with men. It, none of this is controversial. I'm Lee Hall. This is British Thought Leaders. Gremlin, and thank you for joining us on British Thought Leaders. Thank you. So uh, You created some of our greatest sitcoms, I mean, Black Box, IT Crowd, Father Ted. I mean, you won several BAFTAs and other awards. How did you discover your talent for comedy writing, and was it a difficult world to get into? Uh, funnily enough, well, it, 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 I talk about this a little bit in the book, but, it, but, but you know, we, we just kind of... Um, used our common sense and one day we were watching um, an episode of Smith and Jones and we noticed that in the credits there were a lot of writers listed. So we thought, oh, they probably take submissions. And, and in, indeed they did. And luckily, <laughs> you know, Griff and Mel, uh, whose show it was, they also owned a talent agency. So through them we got our first agents. So everything just kind of fell into place, but there was a bit of hustling before that, a bit of trying to, you know, get things on different radio shows and stuff like this, because we heard that radio shows, radio was the way in. But in the end, that wasn't true for us. It was, uh, it, it was sketch comedy that got us our, our ticket, you know. So, um, yeah, and once, once we landed that, then everything became... Slightly easier, you know, an agent just takes care of so much stuff for you, arranges meetings and, and, and all that type of thing. So, um, uh, yeah, it was, a, once, you know, it, it is true that once you get your foot in the door, then that's when you can really get to work, you know, and start thinking of yourself seriously as a com comedy writer or whatever it happens to be. I really enjoyed your book. Uh, the chapter about you doing the casting for Father Ted, I found that quite touching. I was thinking, you know, well, why is that? And I think it's because I'm so connected with the characters. They're, they're kind of part of our culture now. Mm. If I give someone a cup of tea and I can do the Mrs. Doyle quote and everyone knows it. You know, how do you create characters that people can connect with on that kind of level? That's a very good question. I'm not... I, I, I don't, I, I, well, the first thing I'll say is if I could do it every time, I would. Mm. Um, you, you know, we got very lucky with our first show in that the premise that we created and the situation we created um, took the outline of a family, a mother, a father, a little boy, a granddad, um, Mrs. Doyle, Ted, Dougal, Father Jack. And when you have a family in a show, you kind of um, hit the ground running yeah. because people lo love to see themselves reflected and love to see their, f their own family reflected. So kids would watch it and think of Dougal as themselves yeah. and, you know, parents would watch it and, and they would identify with Ted. Um, and, you know, it was just kind of, um, it was, it was a, a stroke of luck, really, that the first significant thing we did we had a kind of failed enterprise before that that didn't quite work out. Uh, but the first major thing we did that people saw, we had that kind of family outline. And um, yeah, once you, I mean, you know, it's kind of a thing you want to protect. You don't want any of the, your inverted commas family to come to too much harm. Mm. So um, you probably treat them sensitively. You, you, as, a, as a writer, you, you feel the same way about them as you would as a viewer. You, you care for them and you worry about them and you enjoy watching them trying to get out of scrapes and you enjoy them getting into scrapes. Um, 
So, yeah, it was a combination of luck, but also, uh, you know, just the, like Arthur had uh, uncles who were priests. So he was able to take a lot of what he'd observed and apply it to the characters. And, and that gave it a kind of authenticity as well um, that we wouldn't have had if we'd been writing about any other group of people because Arthur, you know, he happened to know priests. So, um, yeah, it's a combination of things, really, you know. Some of it deliberate. <laughs> Do you think if you wrote Father's Head now, it would get commissioned now? Mm. No, but I don't think there'd be a reason to write it now. The, the, the Catholic Church is kind of a, you know, at the time we wrote it, the Catholic Church, certainly in Ireland, was still a kind of a significant um, force. Mm. And uh, religion seems to have kind of lost its, um, lost its grip on society, both in the UK and in Ireland. Uh, and so writing a, a, a satire about religion would be a waste of time, I think, at the moment, you know. I'd rather write a satire about the various new religions that have popped up in, in, in Catholicism and, you know, the Church of England's place, you know, kind of insane um, liberal groupthink, you know, that would be worth puncturing at the moment. On that subject, is political correctness seems to have done quite some damage to comedy, really. Like, jokes can't be made, shows have been cancelled. Mm. What kind of role do you feel comedy should play apart from, obviously, making people laugh? Well, I think it should, um, it should always uh, question whatever the prevailing narrative happens to be. Even if the prevailing narrative is positive, it should be, it should be providing a, an ironic counterpoint to all of that. Uh, because nothing created by humans is so perfect that it can't be made fun of and, and, um, and you know, pilloried. So, uh, so, yeah, so it's a very dangerous time when a group of people, at the moment, it, it appears to be the, you know, the middle classes, um, have decided that certain areas are, uh, you're, are not, uh, it's not permissible to make fun of them or to uh, show the flaws in the thinking. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think it's got a, I always just felt if everyone is doing one thing, you shouldn't be doing that. You should be going the other way. I mean, you know, when people were doing, uh, when people were doing single camera sitcoms, because The Office was so successful, I continued doing uh, sitcoms in front of an audience simply because I just thought, well, why add to the amount of things that all have the same style? Why not try and, you know, create something that, that kind of moves against it? Um, and, and, you know, up until the last show, I think, which, which, wasn't, which didn't really do great numbers, Count Arthur Strong, which I'm still very proud of, uh, that, that technique kind of worked for me, you know. Um, uh, it just seemed that, you know, if you provide some sort of uh, opposing model, then you'll always stand out. And you're talking in your book a bit about the jester, this role that the jester had in kind of reflecting to power you know, things that are being done wrong, but in a way that's kind of, you know, not going to get them into too much trouble. Yeah. Is that a, a thing that's happening now, or do you think that has kind of been lost by comedy? Yeah, I think all comedy now is establishment comedy. I call, I call most comedians these days re regime comedians, because the, the, the regime, the particular regime that, that is in power, is the mob, you know? It's it basically, uh, if you step out of line, if you touch what are considered third rail subjects, um, you know, uh, then you, you are immediately um, uh, the subject of incredibly hostile scrutiny. Mm. There's a famous quote, I think Jimmy Carr said this about someone else, he said, uh, the joke that will destroy my life is already out there, right. which means that if you look through someone's Twitter or through their stand-up act, uh, the, the reams of material that's placed online, what you're actually also doing is you're giving your enemies the means with which they can eventually destroy you. Mm -hmm. 
the question is, will they or, or won't they? And in my particular case, um, like, as soon as I started talking about women's rights, they started mining my history for things to use to destroy me. And the funny thing about me is I was such a good little lefty that they couldn't find anything. So they had to make stuff up. So they've done things like, for instance, um, they fake screenshots of me admitting to sending uh, women photographs of my penis. Really? Oh, yeah. Um, the, 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 their method is very much like um, the way the Sciento Scientologists used to target their enemies, where they would literally go around someone's area and put up posters saying that X was a paedophile and stuff, you know. That's what they do. Tra that's trans, trans activists use the various um, techniques of, of, of control employed by cults like Scientologists. Um, to uh, to maintain a, con a general control over the discussion, and so when you step outside of what they de deem acceptable, then you immediately kind of um, leave yourself exposed. And what I didn't realize, and what I was very naive about, was I genuinely thought my friends and colleagues would see what was happening and, and help. So it's been a very strange and sobering experience, you know. I, I realize now that none of us were ever safe. As soon as the internet kind of came along, no, none of us were safe. And uh, I just happened to touch the, the biggest third rail of all, really, which was trans rights. I mean, the subtitle for your book is How I Made and, and Lost a Career in Comedy. Can you just talk us through what happened from you being one of Britain's best loved comedy writers to you know, losing your career and other things as well? Yeah, well, I basically, everything was going great. I, um, you know, one of the last things that happened before this all kicked off was a standing ovation for a Lifetime Achievement Award at the Comedy Awards. Mm -hmm. And then the instant I started talking about women's rights, um, all of that disappeared, you know, the support. I started to get abused by trans rights activists online. They targeted me and my family. They released my, my family's home address. Uh, they sent the police to my door several times. And at the same time, all these people who I had known for my whole life, had been friends with, just completely deserted me, you know. And I would ask them, what do you disagree with? What, what, where do we differ? like on a subject like women in switch, do women deserve fair sports? Mm. Or do these men who are currently stealing their medals and their places on podiums and their pri cash, their prize money, are these men cheats or not? And they simply refuse to answer. Mm. You know, the, the amount of looking the other way from people who I thought were moral good people. You, you spend your whole life reading about um, other occasions in which uh, friends let other friends down, like the McCarthy, um, uh, the McCarthy years, and and you know, from everything from the, the you know the Stasi, I, I believe something like one in six was it one in six people in East Germany were members of the Stasi, were informing on their friends and friends and colleagues, and. Um, you see all this and you just think it's part of history, you know? And then, and then when, it, when a, a moment comes when all you would need would be the support and friendship of the people who are supposedly your friends, it just evaporates, you know? So, and, and what was most surprising to me was that it evaporated on something as fundamental as the right of our daughters to go into a space that's female only and not encounter a man. Who are the views you're expressing? Were they that controversial? They, they, they're not. They're not. They never have been. This is not a controversial... My positions are not controversial. Mm. What has happened, though, is that I unfortunately know a lot of very weak people who, who don't have the courage to actually stand by me and say, yeah, of course women deserve fair sports. Of course women deserve single sex spaces. Of course a victim of rape shouldn't be placed in a crisis center with, with men 
it, none of this is controversial. We saw in Scotland recently um, Andrew, the case of Andrew Miller, you know, uh, who uh, abducted a a a eleven year old girl, uh, raped her repeatedly, um, while dressed as a woman, um, and you know that's what self ID means. Self ID means that anyone, the future Andrew Millers of the world can go into a space with my daughter, my friends, daughters, wives, um, without being challenged. And if my daughter or, or a woman was to challenge one of these men, they would get into trouble. So someone like Andrew Miller, um, he gets treated like he's part of a sacred class right up until the moment that he abducts and, and tortures a little girl, you know? So how are we supposed to, you know, we're often told, well, he's not representative of the vast majority of, of trans people, but how are girls to know? How is a young girl to know the difference? Until, uh, you, do, do, do they have to wait until something happens before they can object? It's a completely untenable position. And I'm still astonished at the amount of people I um, used to know who don't grasp that basic fact. So some of the things that have happened, uh, you've listed some, and like for example, male rapists getting put into a female prison as well. It's just hard to understand how we got to this point. Do you think if more people spoke out like you have, we wouldn't be in this mess? Yeah, I mean, it's that's it. Like the problem that people like me have, and you know, <laughs> J.K. Rowling to some extent, is simply that other people who know we're, to, we're right haven't stood beside us and told the truth, you know? I had no idea what I was up against, you know? I, 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 I didn't realize how um, entrenched already gender ideology was in the entertainment world. But it's, um, but yeah, it, it, it's, it's the case in, in a lot of middle class industries. Uh, the media, publishing, theater, uh, the arts world, um, these kind of middle class privileged um, uh, environments are, have just been completely taken over by gender ideology. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, uh, it's led to an incredible, uh, uh, it's the dog that didn't bark. You know, we, the, the, I think the chilling effect of, of what's going on is, it, it's, it's obviously going to be extremely hard to measure because you're, you're, you're trying to measure something that's not there. And um, who knows what uh, artists and comedians are just deciding it's not even worth it. Because even if you do forge a career, uh, you could be taken down at, at any time by a kind of a, 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 an unseen jury that um, is able to make up any old uh, nonsense about you. Uh, and get away with it. So I would say, yeah, I think there's probably a, the, the damage from these years is, can be seen in both the visible damage and that it's done to people like James Dreyfus, um, but also the invisible damage of, of the comedians and writers and, and, and thinkers who are, who are just not daring to step outside the ordained lines. Do you think our arts have suffered because of that? Yes. I mean, you know, there, there was a list of uh, feminists handed around in the art world, you know, and in publishing. You know, this person is a TERF, you know, the, like lists of so-called TERFs, mm -hmm. um, uh, which stands for Trans Exclusionary Radical Feminist. Um, and, uh, and, you know, like, it, it, that's like something from, from uh, you know, Mao, Mao's China. It's extraordinary level of um, intolerance and uh, surveillance. Yeah, you know, so um, yeah, it's a, it's and it's completely anti-human. It's anti-art, and it's all based on a, uh, a load of nonsense from American academia. You know, that somehow managed to escape the uh, you know the the colleges that it came out of and is now running rampant around the around the world harming people very severely you're talking your book about the trap in the sitcom 
the trap being the reason that the characters can't just kind of leave and go and do something else. I mean, what was the trap for you? You couldn't just be quiet about women's rights and carry on with your comedy. Was it a, a moral um, reason? Yeah, that's it. It's, it's that simple. I just thought, well, you know, while people are losing their livelihoods, while women are afraid to speak or being or men in masks are trying to abuse them at demonstrations and shout over them and then it becomes uh it become it be, you know it moves outside of being a decision you have to do it i felt uh i still find it extraordinary that people that more people aren't involved in in you know like i've had i've colleagues the colleagues on the father ted musical who who just watched as i was harassed and um and and had my musical stolen from me um you know they've all got they've all got daughters they've all got wives and yet they still aren't speaking up like they wouldn't do it for friendship which was shocking enough to me but the fact they wouldn't do it for the women in their lives i just find that extraordinary you know, I don't see how one could not try and fight this, you know. Do you think we're at the point where the tide is turning a bit and the public is starting to wake up to some of the damage being done to women's rights and to children's rights in the name of gender identity? Yeah, I mean, we've been waiting for years now for the court cases to start coming in mm -hmm. of detransitioners who will be suing their doctors. We, it's only, we knew it was only a matter of time, and the first first significant ones have started in the States, I think. There's a few here as well that are very important. Richie Heron, who's suing the NHS, and we've already obviously had people like Kira Bell, um, who've been very brave in exposing what's going on. And I, yeah, I, but unfortunately, the, the, it, it, the process is still taking a long time, and it's slower than it should be, because, you know, like, the, if you read The Guardian, for instance, you would not have a clue any of this is happening because they, they very, very consciously suppress all information about this, you know? So, um, yeah, I think the tide is turning, but it's more like a battleship turning, you know? It's a slow process, but, but we'll get there, I think. So it seems, unless someone's quite heavily into the kind of Twitter world, they wouldn't really know a lot of these things are happening. <laughs> One interesting problem that we have is that the stories are so mad that when we repeat them, people think we're mad, you know? And it's, it's, it's so you, you might show, I don't know, what's a good thing, a uh, good example? Laurel Hubbard is the uh, male weightlifter who, um, uh, New Ze I think New Zealand, um, and uh, <laughs> like Laurel Hubbard now has the, um, the world record for women's weightlifting. And he, he beat two indigenous New Zealand women. Mm -hmm. So this is what our, our new kind uh, uh, culture has given us. Two, two indigenous women in New Zealand who lost their world record to a man. You know, and you tell, and w when we were trying to get signat signatories for a letter supporting J.K. Rowling, uh, we approached John Cleese, and he said, "Is that story true?" And we said, "Yes." And and he was laughing out loud. He said, "But that's what the that's what the Pythons were saying," and it it just it is extraordinary. But you have to actually kind of hold people still and say, "It's happening. It's not. It's not. You know, it's not just internet madness." You know, they're giving these kids drugs that will put them into, like, young women, into early menopause, you know. These poor kids who think they're turning into young, virile boys are actually turning into old women. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the crisis, the mental health crisis, and, the, and just the health crisis that, that kind of arrived, these, these people are going to be in, going, visiting hospitals for the rest of their lives. They're in their 20s. And they're going to be visiting hospitals for the rest of their lives. I had cancer when I was like 50, 49, something like that. A um, lot of visits, visits to the hospital. It's not something you want to be doing as a regular thing in your life. That's what these kids all have in front of them, you know. And no one told them. No one told them. Everyone lied to them, you know. Um, there's essentially a, a, these kids have no idea what they've done to themselves. They're, and, you know, they're going to come out of all this. Um, knowing that society as a whole lied to them mm -hmm. and, 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 and did not 
stop them from walking off this cliff. And I, I just don't know what the mental health ramifications are, of that are going to be. Mm. So when you're a child and you say, oh, I'm Superman, and your parents are like, yeah, you are, and then you say, I'm going to jump out the window, and they're like, no, you're not. Yeah. Because that's what our parents should do. Yeah. But with these kids, it's like, I'm going to change gender. The, the parents should be saying, no, you're a child. Well, you know, there's a few things that, ha that are happening. You know, a lot of these parents have been convinced that the children will kill themselves if they don't, if they don't get what they want. Uh, a lot of the kids have learned from online forums and so on that that actually is the way to get what you want. You, you threaten to kill yourself. Um, you know, there's a lot of victims in this, not just, I, you know, while I do think that the, the so-called parents of trans children are often the, the most frightening people in this because they, they will do anything to not face what they've done to their kids. Um, I also know there's a lot of lot of parents who who just couldn't stop it. It was like a, a an out of control freight train, you know. Uh, like I I've heard this phrase used twice now by by different parents, where they say my 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 daughter or my son is dead set on it, you know, and and you know they found out in Ireland that fifty percent of the kids who are being um, treated and told that they're trans are autistic, you know. So when you have autistic traits and you find something and there's something that's being offered as this will solve all your problems, it's so dangerous and disastrous for these for these kids. But so parents are basically, you know, there, there's there's a certain type the activist parents they're a real they're a real problem, but there's others who are, I'm afraid just trying to do as much damage control as they can, trying to do things like delay the moment that the kid will start taking testosterone or whatever it is. Uh, but they'll keep supporting and loving their kids because they've no other choice. Um, but they're watching their kids take the worst decisions of their lives. Graham Renner, thank you for joining us on British Thought Leaders. Thank you.